In the last video in this series, number four, we started to look at some of the fundamental issues surrounding Riemannian geometry, and in particular we introduced the idea of the metric tensor for a frame of reference or measuring system. In this video, we wish to develop that idea, particularly as it pertains to a flat two-dimensional space, and we'll discuss the metric tensors of various frames of reference which can be used to measure such a space, and how the concepts can be developed for more than two dimensions. Before we can do that, we need to introduce a formula which will be extremely important as we move towards general relativity. In connection with what we've already been doing, it's the formula for the measurement of the arc length between two infinitesimally close points in space, and it's given in the Einstein summation convention as ds squared equals dxm dxn gmn. Now this might well seem quite strange if you've not come across it before, but hopefully we can approach it in such a way that the concept is easily grasped. In order to get to an understanding of it and see how it comes about and what it means, we'll need to move from considering what might be called macroscopic vectors to differential vectors or what might be termed microscopic vectors. For instance, instead of dealing with a macroscopic displacement vector S, we'll move towards developing the formula for the differential vector DS, an infinitesimally small displacement in some space of two, three, or even four dimensions. Before we can make that move, however, we'll spend a little time going over some of the important ideas around what we might term macroscopic vectors. You should recall that in the last video, number four, we considered a flat two-dimensional space and explored two scenarios. In the first, the coordinates that were used to measure the space were straightforward Cartesian with axes x1 and x2, which stood for the usual x and y. These axes were set at right angles to one another and included equally spaced lines of constant unit separation. The basis vectors in this Cartesian coordinate system were given the symbols E1 and E2, and considered to be unit dimensionless vectors along the x1 and x2 axes, similar to the i and j of the ijk vectors used in vector analysis. In the second scenario, one of these axes, the x2 or y-axis, was tilted at an oblique angle alpha to the other. Each of these frames of reference were drawn in black and given the same axes as one another, x1 and x2. Only when we're considering transformations from one frame to another, we will use red and blue colouring and label the blue axis x tilde. Most of the discussion in the last video centred on the angled frame of reference, and the basis vectors in that frame were once again given the symbols E1 and E2, and considered to be dimensionless unit vectors along each axis. Any macroscopic vector V in this space, which was to be described by measurements using these angled axes, was considered to have two different types of components. Those shown here with upper indices 1 and 2, were called the contravariant components of the vector and were found by drawing the dashed lines parallel to the axes. These contravariant components were scalar values, which when multiplied by the basis vectors E1 and E2, gave the vector V via the simple parallelogram addition of two vectors. The vector formula for this, of course, could be written as V equals V1 E1 plus V2 E2, or it could be written as a vector matrix equation, like this. Furthermore, we could use the Einstein summation convention to make this equation appear much simpler and write it as the vector V equals Vm Em. Here, because there are no indices on the left-hand side, we can say that this is a single equation. Also, the sum, in this case, is over the repeated index m, which goes from 1 to 2 for the two dimensions. This latter equation would look the same even in those situations where we might be dealing with three or more dimensions, even though the more expanded ways of writing it would become a little more complicated. For example, in three dimensions, this same equation would mean v equals v1e1 plus v2e2 plus v3e3, and so on.
The other components of the vector V in our two-dimensional space, those which were given the lower indices 1 and 2, were called the covariant components of the vector and were found by dropping perpendiculars to the axes. It is perhaps less easy at this stage to see the significance of these covariant components, but hopefully that will become clearer later. We must stress again that these names, contravariant and covariant components, apply to all types of vectors, whether or not the vectors themselves are contravariant or covariant. The simple idea of contravariant and covariant vectors was discussed in video number three. Any kind of vector in these two dimensions is said, therefore, to have four components. Those found from using the parallel lines, the contravariant components, and those found by dropping perpendiculars, the covariant components. We'll explain later exactly why the names contravariant and covariant were chosen for these various components, but for now, they're just names given to distinguish between these two types of components. Once again, however, it's worth noting that a good way of remembering whether to use upper or lower indices is to consider the third letter of the word contravariant or the third letter of covariant. N is upward pointing and V is downward pointing. You should also realise that in the way we're working, both types of components, contravariant and covariant, contain the units of the vector concerned. So that, for example, if V was a velocity vector, all of these four components would be scalars, which we might call the speed components. If the vector V was a displacement vector, then these components would be scalars, which we might call the distance components. Working with the simple skewed frame of reference in the last video, number four, where the two axes were at an angle alpha to one another, we were also able to find a relationship between the contravariant upper components and the covariant lower components of a vector at a point in any given frame of reference. The simplest way to express this relationship was by using the Einstein summation convention like this, Vn lower equals Vm upper times Gmn. And here, Gmn is known as the metric tensor for the particular frame of reference, and we interpret this rather short-looking equation really to be a series of equations. Two in this case, because we have only two dimensions. They are the expressions for V1 and V2 lower in terms of V1 and V2 upper. The way to realise these equations from the summation convention is first to say that n is not a repeated index on the left-hand side of the equation, so there's no summation on that side simply two equations from taking n equals 1 and n equal to 2. On the other hand, the repeated index of m on the right-hand side must be summed over the two values of m from 1 to 2 within each equation, so that there must be two terms within each equation. On account of the fact that this is a flat space and that the axes do not distort or change for different positions, these four values of g within the metric tensor would each be constant everywhere in the whole space. They would not change from place to place. They are, in this particular case, constants of the frame of reference. We also discussed the idea that the two equations could be written in matrix form, like this, and that the four g values were actually equal to the dot products of the various basis vectors of the two-dimensional frame of reference, as shown here, we can see that the 1s and 2s of the g values represent the basis vectors in each dot product. With the coordinates we were looking at, which had basis vectors of unit value, these dot products were easy to calculate and were constant throughout that particular space. From further mathematical manipulation, we also found an expression for the dot product of a vector with itself or the magnitude squared of the vector, and this was written for the vector v using the Einstein summation like this, v dot v equals vm upper times vm lower, or we could have it written like this. Once again, you should be starting to see into this expression that this represents one equation. There's no index on the left, and it says that in two dimensions, the square of the magnitude of the vector is given by this, 
V1 upper times V1 lower plus V2 upper times V2 lower. So we have quite a few equations that we can write down and which apply to this particular situation, this flat space with this particular set of axes at an angle alpha, the reference frame in question. You should keep in the back of your mind that if we had a space with more than two dimensions, and if the frame of reference measuring that space had complicated curvilinear coordinates, then the Einstein summation equations that we've written down here would look exactly the same. However, with more dimensions, things would really be quite different. More equations after expansion, and more terms in each equation. Furthermore, with curvilinear coordinates, the g-values would, in all likelihood, be different at different places within the space, even if the space itself was flat. So for simplicity, we'll stick with this particular frame of reference, which has oblique axes at an angle alpha to one another, and we'll consider using it to measure a two-dimensional flat space. Given that, let's consider just two of these equations in a little more detail. The first equation here is saying that the metric tensor at a point in the space relates the contravariant component of a vector at that point to its covariant component at that point. Remembering that the metric tensor at a point in this two-dimensional space contains four numbers. The second equation is saying that at any point in the space where there is a vector v, the dot product of the vector with itself, which is the magnitude squared, is given by the sum of the product of the vector's contravariant component at that point with its covariant component at that point. The question we now wish to consider is this. Can we find a way of combining these two equations so that we have v squared, the square of the magnitude of the vector, equal to something with only contravariant components in it, things with only upper indices? Well, we can, of course, by simple substitution using these formulae in the Einstein convention form. However, we are perhaps not yet that well versed in manipulating these Einsteinian summation things. So let's do it the long way by expanding things out and manipulating the explicit equations that these two equations represent in the two dimensions. And then we'll look back at this shorthand and see if it could have been done much more quickly and easily via the summation equations. Here are the expanded equations for these two expressions for two dimensions. There are two equations for the first expression and one equation for the second to get rid of the covariant or lower components, let's substitute this covariant v1 lower into here, and this covariant v2 lower into here, which I'm sure you realise will mean that we'll be left with an equation with only contravariant upper components in it, as well, of course, as the g's. The two substitutions give this, which when expanded becomes this. Now, carefully looking at this, you should realize that these two terms are identical. V1 and V2 are scalars, so the order in which you multiply them doesn't matter. And also, G21 is the same as G12, because they are simply the dot product of the basis vectors E1 and E2, and the ordering in a dot product doesn't matter either. This means that we could, in this particular situation, combine these two terms into one with a factor of two in front of it. But we won't. We'll leave them separate. What we will do, however, is make them look more sensibly ordered. This G21 could be G12, so that the numbers in it agree with these numbers. And similarly for this G12. And doing that gives this. We now have the square of the magnitude of the vector in terms of just the contravariant or upper index components, rather than a mixture of upper and lower. But we also now have the metric tensor in there as well. We can, of course, simplify this equation by using the Einstein summation convention. And if you think about it, you should see that this equation, with its four terms, can be written like this. v squared equals vm upper times vn upper times gmn. The interpretation of this being that there are no indices on the left-hand side, so this is just one equation. However, there are two repeated indices on the right-hand side, a sum in m and a sum in n. 
And so we have two sums to work through. And this, if you've thought about it, would give us the four terms that we found for our two-dimensional situation. Now, therefore, as well as this expression for the square of the magnitude of the size of a vector at a point, in terms of both its contravariant and covariant components, the up and down multiplication, we also have this, which is the same thing, but in terms of just its contravariant components, as well, of course, as the metric tensor. Now, could we have found this expression without expanding out the equations before making the substitution? Could we have taken the two expressions in their Einsteinian summation form and reduced them to this answer more quickly? Let's see. Here are the original equations in that form. Well, we would need to put this covariant component Vn into here where the covariant Vm is. And being inexperienced, we may well have said that we couldn't do this because the lower indices, n and m, are all wrong. However, we should realise that it doesn't matter what letters are used for a particular summation as long as they don't clash within the same equation. Here, in this second equation, the letter m is simply used for summation and there is no clash with any other letters in this particular formula. That means that this second equation could have been written with n instead of m, or in fact with any other letter, and it would have meant exactly the same thing. So if we make that change from m to n in that equation, the two equations then become these. And it's much easier to see that direct substitution of this into this would give us our answer straight away. And it gives that the square of the vector is Vn upper times Vm upper times Gmn, which, as the order of these multiplied scalar components doesn't matter, could be written with Vm first to match the order Mn in the metric tensor, just for neatness. So, we have the square of the size of the vector in terms of its contravariant components and the metric tensor, just as we found by the long method. We could then, if we wished, have expanded out this expression by working through the summations to give what we found while doing the long method, namely this. And if we wanted to combine the two middle terms, of course, we could do, as they are identical. So, what was the point of us doing all this? Why is it important to have this different way of writing the square of the magnitude of a vector in terms of just its contravariant components and the metric tensor. Well, it is important, and the reason is that it will lead us into doing some simple differential Riemannian geometry, and this will be crucial to studying general relativity later. Why do we say that? Well, once we get into discussing curved spaces, or what have been loosely called distorted spaces, we will be forced to use curvilinear coordinate axes, possibly something like this. And with these kind of curvilinear coordinates, whether measuring curved space or flat space, it's not appropriate to deal with a macroscopic vector v in the way we did before, simply by drawing an arrow in the space and finding its components. For example, if the v here is a displacement... How on earth can you find the components of it in this space, contravariant or covariant? How, for example, could you draw a line from the end of the vector parallel to this axis? It doesn't make sense. No, if we're talking about displacement, we're going to have to start thinking in terms of differential vectors, infinitesimally small displacements, dx or dv or ds, or whatever, which we can allow to tend to zero and then work with some kind of differential calculus. If we're dealing with a velocity, it will be at a point in space where we are indeed looking at the instantaneous rate of change of distance with respect to time, dx by dt, and similarly for other kinds of vectors. Of course, we can do all this by homing in on some particular point in the space and working with calculus. Let's suppose then for simplicity that once again we have a flat two-dimensional space 
the plane of this screen. But for some reason, we've chosen to map it out with this curvilinear set of coordinates, and we choose to make measurements using these coordinate measures. We're keeping it simple by not having a curved, distorted space, but simply having curvilinear coordinates to measure a flat space. I'm sure you realise that the metric tensor for this space could be rather complicated. There will, of course, be four entries in it because it's a two-dimensional space, but each of those four values will depend on where you are in the space. Every point in space will probably have a different set of four numbers in the metric tensor. In fact, we would probably write the metric tensor like this, gmn of x, to indicate that it depends on position. The x here, of course, is a shorthand for the x1 and x2 values in a two-dimensional space. And I suppose we probably ought to write it like this, gmn of x1 and x2. We could, of course, write this more explicitly in two dimensions and see the four elements in it, each of which would depend on position. Although this, once again, should probably be written with x1 and x2, rather than simply x. We should stress once again here that this means that every point in this two-dimensional space, measured by these wavy-looking lines, will have its own four values for g. And these will, in simple terms, depend on the angle between the x1 and x2 axes at that point, and the extent to which e1 and e2 were stretched or compressed at that point. We will be considering such a small region tending to a point that the coordinate lines can be considered at that point to be straight and at some angle to one another. Let's shift, therefore, to thinking about infinitesimally small vectors. Suppose you had a particle of some sort here at this black dot, and suppose it made an infinitesimally small displacement, which we'll call vector ds. It's really very small, but we'll show it large enough for us to see. Now, we don't have lots of closely packed coordinate lines on this diagram, which would help us to see what the axes are doing at that point. But it would seem to me that the E1 and E2 directions at the point would be something like this. The E1 axis is not bending much in that region, so E1 at the point is pretty obviously going in that direction. And the tangent to the curve of the E2 axis at that point, if we guess, will be something like that. Don't forget, these E1 and E2 may or may not be unit vectors. They could be stretched or compressed, which would make them greater or less than 1. But we can say that they are in the direction of the tangents to the wavy lines at the point under scrutiny. And so they are not necessarily 90 degrees to one another. All three of the arrows shown here are, in a sense, at the point where the small black dot is situated. We've only drawn these arrows extending over space so that we can see them. And the question we now want to pose is this. Can we write down an expression for the size of ds in terms of one of the pairs of components of the ds vector, say the contravariant pair or the covariant pair? Well, when we had a macroscopic vector v in a flat space with fixed axes at an acute angle alpha to each other, we could show the vector addition of the two component vectors v1, e1 and v2, e2 like this in the parallelogram form. And we were also able to show, in fact we've just shown, that the magnitude squared of such a macroscopic vector v in that situation was given by this formula, which involved four terms in our two dimensions and where vm and vn, upper indices, were the contravariant components of the vector and gmn was the metric tensor at the point. Actually, it was the metric tensor everywhere in that particular space because the angle between the axes was the same everywhere. That expression, if you recall, expanded out to this. Now, however, although we're dealing with a single point and using curvilinear coordinates in a flat space, we effectively have the same kind of situation. The vector ds is so small that we will write its contravariant components as dx1 and dx2 upper like this. 
which when multiplied by the basis vectors E1 and E2 at that point, give the component vectors in the parallelogram of addition, so that at the point we effectively have this. Now make sure you're completely happy with this. We've got wavy coordinates in our two-dimensional flat space, but we're looking at such a small region of that space that they are effectively straight, in which case we have an exactly similar situation at that point to the one we had for the large vector v in our obliquely angled straight coordinates. And for that previous macroscopic situation, we've just shown that the square of the size of the vector v could be written in terms of its contravariant upper components like this. So if we compare our ds vector diagram with the one we had for the macroscopic vector v, this time only labeling the sizes of the vectors and their components, it should be obvious that we have an almost identical kind of situation for our microscopic ds in our curvilinear coordinates as we had for our macroscopic v in the angle coordinates. That means that we can say that ds squared, the square of the magnitude of this infinitely small displacement ds at a point, must be given by ds squared equals dxm dxn, both upper, times gmn, which of course, when expanded out for these two dimensions, gives us the four terms like this. And once again, because the ordering of multiplied scalars or in dot products doesn't matter, the two middle terms here are identical and could be added together and given a number two in front of them, but we leave them separate for now. Now this equation is really important. It is so important that it might be as well to break it down a little in order to become familiar with it. It's true in all spaces, whether they're flat or curved. It's true in the usual types of axes we've been using so far, or for more exotic curvilinear axes. And the reason it's true for all spaces and with all types of axes is that within an infinitesimally small region of any space, we can consider the spatial axes to be straight lines and at some angle to one another, which is exactly the scenario we've been looking at with the macroscopic vector v, with simple but oblique coordinates in a flat space. So let this equation sink in. At any infinitesimally small point in any kind of space with any kind of curvilinear coordinates, the lines can be considered to be straight lines with some angle between them, determined by where the point is. The basis vectors E1 and E2 at the point could have magnitudes greater than 1, equal to 1, or less than 1. But the displacement ds will have legitimate contravariant upper components along those basis vectors found by drawing parallel lines. Every point in the space could have a diagram like this, the differences being the directions and sizes of E1 and E2. In other words, the differences being in the metric tensor at each point. We could, of course, draw this diagram labelled only by the size of ds and the size of its contravariant components. Whichever way we draw it, the relationship between dx1, dx2 and ds will be via the metric tensor at that point. The metric tensor, of course, will contain all the information about E1 and E2 because basically that's what the metric tensor is all about. Now, having stated this important equation, it might be as well to look at some examples of the metric tensor for various two-dimensional frames of reference. What does the metric tensor actually look like? We'll keep it simple and we'll consider only flat spaces which can be described by various types of coordinates for now. The obvious one to start with is Cartesian coordinates. This is the simplest of all, a nice rectangular, equally spaced grid with basis vectors of magnitude equal to 1. The metric tensor here is the same at every point in the space. How do we know? Well, you should recall that the metric tensor came from the dot products of the various basis vectors, namely these four equations. But for Cartesian coordinates, E1 and E2 
are unit size everywhere and they are orthogonal to one another, which means that at any and every point in space for this frame of reference, we have g11 equal to 1 because it's the dot product of a unit vector with itself. We have g21 equal to 0 because it's the dot product of two unit vectors which are at right angles to one another, and so on. If we use our newfound formula for the square of the value of an infinitesimally small displacement vector ds in this space, namely this formula, it can be expanded out as this. And if we remember that g11 and g22 are equal to 1, and g12 and g21 are 0, we can see that the middle two terms disappear, and we're left with something really rather simple and obvious, that ds squared equals dx1 squared plus dx2 squared for this frame of reference. This should be no surprise. In Cartesian coordinates, the square of the size of a vector is simply the sum of the squares of its components, and the components using this frame of reference are at right angles to one another. We're simply applying Pythagoras to the two x1 and x2 components, dx1 and dx2. Again, you should realize that we've chosen in this diagram to label only the size of the vectors, ds, dx1, and dx2, rather than write them actually as vectors. They're in italics here and not bold. If we wanted to know the metric tensor for this Cartesian system, it would be a very simple matrix. It would be what we call the identity matrix, and it would be the same everywhere in the space. It would not change with position at all. You probably know that the identity matrix has ones in the diagonal elements and zeros everywhere else, and that it's called the identity matrix because if you multiply any two-dimensional vector by it, the answer gives you back the same vector. It's unchanged. For example, this vector AB is still the same AB after multiplication by the identity matrix 1, 0, 0, 1. And I'm sure you also realize that for a flat three-dimensional space with Cartesian coordinates, the same Einsteinian summation equation would hold, where it's shown here with the GMN before the dx's instead of after. In three dimensions, of course, there would then be a summing over m and n from 1 to 3, which would give nine terms altogether, like this. Once again, however, in this Cartesian frame of reference, the three diagonal elements, g11, g22, and g33, would be 1, because e1.e1 e1 is 1, e2.e2 e2 is 1, and e3.e3 e3 is 1. On the other hand, all the off-diagonal terms would be 0, because all three axes are orthogonal, so the dot products of different e's would be 0 meaning that this would all boil down to this, which again is simply Pythagoras in three dimensions. The metric tensor for this frame of reference, of course, would be given by the three-dimensional identity matrix, which has ones in the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. OK, that's what the metric tensor would look like for two- and three-dimensional Cartesian coordinates being used to measure two- and three-dimensional flat spaces. Before we move on to consider the metric tensor of a second frame of reference, it might be as well to mention that each metric tensor can have an inverse. In fact, this is true, of course, for any kind of matrix or tensor. If you have a matrix of some sort, A, then there will exist its inverse, which we label as A-1, such that when these are multiplied together, they will give the identity matrix. We could write that relationship like this, where the square brackets are meant to represent matrices with some number of dimensions. The uppercase I here represents the identity matrix full of ones in the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. In the case of the metric tensor for Cartesian coordinates, its inverse is fairly trivial. It's the same thing, so that in two dimensions we would have this, Yes, I know this is trivial. That times that is 1. That times that is 0. That times that is 0. And that times that is 1. 
But in fact, the first of these matrices could be said to be the inverse of the second. And so multiplied together, they give the identity matrix. The fact that each of them, for Cartesian coordinates, is already the identity matrix makes it look rather trivial. However, it will be important to be aware of and accept this kind of idea later. Every metric tensor for every kind of frame of reference measuring any kind of space will have an inverse tensor. And when these are multiplied together, they will give the identity matrix. A way of writing this for the metric tensor in the Einstein summation convention would be like this, which in a sense is this. The GMN with lower indices is what we've considered to be the metric tensor for the frame of reference where M and N are the dimensions of the space. The GMN with upper indices is a way of writing its inverse. And of course, when one of these acts on the other, it gives the identity matrix full of ones in the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. More examples of this kind of thing will be given as we go along, and the reason for the upper indices for the inverse should then become apparent. Okay, let's leave inverses behind and come back to them later, and let's now look at a second frame of reference in order to see what its metric tensor looks like. We measure the same flat two-dimensional space as before, but this time we'll have the x2 axis tilted at some oblique angle alpha to the x1 axis. We look to discover its metric tensor and think about what the inverse of that might be. And we'll do that once again by first thinking about the formula for ds squared, the square of the size of an infinitesimally small displacement vector ds at some point in the space. First thing to say, of course, is that the metric tensor must be the same at every point in this space. We know that as a fact because the axis system is the same everywhere in the space, and the metric tensor is always given by the dot products of the basis vectors. The basis vectors E1 and E2 never change as you move around in this reference frame, they don't change their angle between one another, and they don't stretch in size. So every point in the space must have the same four G values for its metric tensor. We're assuming that E1 and E2 are each of unit size for this particular situation, and that the angle between them is alpha. Now clearly the dot product of a unit vector with itself gives the answer 1, a scalar also, the dot product of E1 and E2 in this situation must be cos alpha, where alpha is the oblique angle between the axes. You should recall from a previous video, number 4, that we got the cos alpha here from the fact that the dot product of two vectors can be written as the product of their sizes times the cosine of the angle between them, and their sizes in this case are 1. This means that for this frame of reference, which has the angle alpha between its coordinate lines, the general formula for the square of the size of an infinitesimally small vector displacement, ds, which expands to this, must, by substitution of the various g values, be equal to this. Now once again, the middle two terms are identical, and even though we haven't so far combined them, let's do that here simply in order to illustrate something in a moment. After sorting, we get that the square of the vector ds is given by this expression. It's clearly not simply a Pythagoras formula, which would just be these two terms. There are what we might call cross terms as well. Now, if you remember your basic geometry, this result with the extra cos alpha terms should not be a surprise either. The situation we have is this. Here is a representation of the parallelogram addition of the two contravariant vectors, shown with only scalar values dx1, dx2, and ds to save clutter. This addition could, of course, be shown as a triangular addition, like this, where the angle delta is 180 degrees minus alpha. From this diagram, we could calculate the side ds, the green line, by using the cosine rule, which is sometimes learnt as 
a squared equals b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cos a. So that in this case, the cosine rule would give ds squared as dx1 squared plus dx2 squared minus 2dx1 dx2 cos delta. But of course, cos delta is minus cos alpha. So the cosine rule effectively tells us what we found from ideas based on the metric tensor, namely that ds squared equals dx1 squared plus dx2 squared plus 2dx1 dx2 cos alpha. If we were to write out the metric tensor for these angle coordinates, it would still be a very simple matrix. 1 cos alpha, cos alpha 1. And these values would be the same everywhere in this flat space. These are not curvilinear coordinates, but rather they have a fixed angle between x1 and x2 everywhere in the space, with no stretching anywhere. At this point, of course, we could look at three dimensions, with each of the axes being at some angle to one another. But we'd have a good bit of extra geometry to do, so we won't bother. I think you get the idea. However, what is easier is to think about the inverse of the metric tensor. I'll leave you to think about the details, and I'll just give the, the answer. Here is the inverse of the metric tensor for this oblique axis frame of reference being used to measure a two-dimensional flat space, where I've taken out the 1 over sine squared alpha simply to make the inside of the matrix bracket look neater. But this is all the inverse metric tensor for this angle frame of reference. Notice the upper indices on the g values. This is the way we write the inverse of the metric tensor, GMN with upper indices. And once again, we can show that it is indeed the inverse by using it to multiply the original metric tensor, which should then give the identity matrix as the result. And it does. You can check it out if you want. OK. Up to now, as far as two-dimensional flat space is concerned, we've looked at two quite simple frames of reference, Cartesian and what we've sometimes called oblique angle. And we've seen how the formula for the square of the size of an infinitesimally small vector behaves via the metric tensor GMN. Let's now consider a third frame of reference, namely that of polar coordinates. We'll still assume a flat space, like the screen you're looking at, but we'll make measurements using polar coordinates, using the radius r and the angle theta. How does the formula for the square of the size of ds work out for this situation? And what would the metric tensor look like for polar coordinates in this two-dimensional flat space? Now this gets a bit fiddly, but stick with it, as there are useful lessons to learn from it, which will be very helpful when we get to thinking about general relativity. Here's our diagram for the measuring system or frame of reference to be used on the flat space. The space is infinite, of course, in its extent, although once again we've enclosed it in a rectangular boundary simply for convenience. The two dimensions x1 and x2 could now be said to be the radius r and angle theta, because these are the two measurements that determine or describe the position of a point in the space. This point, assume it's a very small dot, can be described by this radius r, measured from the centre of the system, and this angle theta, measured from this particular axis or radius line. So the radius r could be said to be x1, and the angle theta x2. We leave this box here as a reminder, just in case we slip from talking about x1 and x2, or r and theta. However, it should strike you that r and theta are in some ways very different to what we've been used to as far as coordinates to measure position are concerned. The x1 and x2 up to now have always been distances. And although in this situation r is a distance measure, the angle theta has no units, it's just an angle. And that might throw up difficulties when we try to use our recent formula for the square of the size of an infinitesimally small displacement vector. This, the size of the displacement vector squared, is definitely a distance squared, but one of these will be an angle with no units, so the mathematics is going to need to sort this out.
and hopefully we'll see how it does that in a minute. For now, however, there are also other issues that we need to get our head around. First of all, we'll look at the radius. The R measurement, or X1 for a point in this space, is measured from the centre of the system, and it's difficult to put it in as a single axis in the usual sense of the word. We can think of it as being measured along here, 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 or whatever. It is, however, unequivocally a distance measure, and we will assume for convenience that the basis vector for it, E1, has unit size, just as we did before, even though we can't say what direction it's in without knowing what point in space we're focusing on. The basis vector E1 might be said to be here, 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 or here, any unit vector pointing out radially. So apart from this directional issue where it points in all sorts of directions, the R measurement is fairly straightforward. Consider, for example, a particular point in the space here at the black dot. And suppose there's a vector V, say, a velocity of something at that point. And suppose for simplicity that it is pointing in the radial direction shown by this green arrow. With this basis vector at that point, shown slightly to one side here to help us see things, the vector v could be simply written, as before, as v equals v1 e1, where this v is the vector itself pointing, in this case, along the radius. e1 is the unit basis vector for the radius measure at that place, and v1 is the contravariant radial component, or in this case, its only component, as this particular vector v doesn't have an angular component, it's pointing along a radius. Granted, the other dimension, the angle will determine the position of the point, in other words, where the vector acts. But in terms of this particular vector itself, we can say that it only has one dimension. And that seems to be consistent with the kind of thing we had before. Remember that our general two-dimensional equation for a vector was given by this, v1 e1 plus v2 e2. But in the case of this radial vector, we have no v2, no angular component. OK, that has more or less explained how we measure radial components of a vector. So now let's think about the theta component of a vector in this space. And this is not so simple. Theta is the angle around the space measured from this black line here. If we were measuring the position of a point here, then theta would be this. If the point were here, then theta would be much larger, like this, and so on. However, as theta is going to have to be our x2, we need it to measure a direction component of the vector. And how can that be? Also, as we've said, the value of theta is not a distance measure, even though we are relating it to what we call the x2 dimension. How can all this be resolved? Well, in order to do that, we will make a number of oversimplifications in the mathematics so that we don't have to consider differential operators and the like, but hopefully the arguments will make some degree of sense. You should already be aware that the extent to which a change in angle makes a change in position in this polar coordinate flat space is very much dependent on the radius. And one way to start thinking about the theta measurement, x2, is to consider arc lengths rather than vectors, for the moment at least. We would surely agree that the angular measurement theta of this black dashed line makes this much difference in position at this value of r, or x1, whereas the same angular difference would make this much difference in position at this value of r, and so on. And that whole idea has implications for the basis vector E2, which we're going to assign to the angle theta, which is to be represented by X2. If we're saying that one unit of angular change makes a difference in position, which is different for different values of the other dimension, R, then it means we will have to consider that the basis vector E2 for angles increases as the radius, or X1, increases. In other words, we're going to have to have basis vectors E2, those for angle, that get bigger as R gets bigger. 
In a previous discussion, we used the language of the basis vector being stretched. And that, in a sense, is what's going to have to happen here. Even though we have flat space, the screen, we're choosing to measure position in that space using this polar coordinate system. And that automatically means a kind of curvilinear coordinates where the x2 basis vector, the one for theta, has a different size depending on the value of the other dimension, x1, that is, the radius r. It's very messy, but let's try and clarify the situation. We know from simple geometry that the arc length, l, in this diagram is given by the radius r multiplied by the angle theta in radians, L equals R theta. And this means that for a given angle theta, the arc length L increases linearly with radius. Using this idea, especially in the limit of small angles, we'll say that the basis vector for theta, E2, which we could say acts along the arc of the circles, or better still, acts tangentially to the arc, must also increase linearly with the size of the radius. Therefore, we'll say that the E2 basis vector for theta has unit length only when R has unit value. In other words, that R equals 1, which we'll assume, say, is this point. That represents the circle at R equals 1. Then, at R equals 2, the theta basis vector E2 would have a size of 2. And at R equals 3, its size would be 3 and so on. This will make the basis vector E2 increase linearly with radius. We're using a kind of stretched frame of reference to measure this flat space. Here are a few other examples of the basis vectors for theta, or E2. And you can see that it changes its direction and changes its size, depending on the value of r and of theta. Clearly at points where r is less than 1, inside the inner circle here, the theta basis vector E2 would also be less than 1, as shown here. Remember, though, that as far as the other dimension is concerned, the r, or x1 dimension, the basis vector E1 always has a value of 1 in this frame of reference, even if it points in different directions, depending on the angle. Our assumptions, therefore, about the sizes or magnitudes of the two basis vectors E1 and E2, or r and theta, are these. The radius basis vector size E1 is 1, and the angle basis vector size E2 is R. Now this seems a strange concept when it's first encountered, especially if you've always tended to use regular Cartesian coordinates where all the basis vectors have a size of 1 and are at right angles to one another. We had begun to talk about axes being stretched, but now we have a situation where, in a sense, that idea is built into the whole concept of the coordinate system, which we call polar coordinates. On the other hand, what is similar to the Cartesian system is the fact that in this polar coordinate frame of reference, the E1, or R, basis vectors are always at right angles to the E2, or theta basis vectors. It's not like the oblique system where the axes are always at some oblique angle alpha to one another, or like curvilinear coordinates where the angle may keep changing. Here, the R axis always intersects the theta axis at 90 degrees, or if you like, the X1 axis is orthogonal to the X2 axis everywhere. In fact, even though the sizing of the basis vector E2 and the direction of the basis vector E1 are both a little confusing, at least we can say that E1 dot E2 is zero everywhere. There will be no cross terms or off-diagonal terms in the metric tensor for this frame of reference. So, given this system and this understanding of the system and the basis vectors, Let's suppose once more that we had a particle at some point in this space, say here, and it had an infinitesimally small displacement vector, ds, shown by this green arrow. Once again, this has been shown much larger for convenience, but remember, this is really very small and is at the point indicated by the black dot. How can we understand our new formula for the square of that displacement, ds squared,
in terms of the two contravariant components of the displacement vector ds and the metric tensor for this polar coordinate frame of reference? Well, here are the basis vectors at that point as I see them. The basis vector E1 for R at that point is shown radially outwards and it has unit length. I've tried to draw it with length the same as the gap between the circles. On the other hand, the basis vector E2 for theta is the tangent to the circle at that point and has a length equal to the radius at that point. And I've tried to draw the length of this line about 1.6 times the gap between the circles because I think the black dot is at the radius of, a, of about 1.6 units. We've said that the basis vectors E1 and E2 must effectively be multiplied by the contravariant components of dS, namely dx1 and dx2, in order to produce the two component vectors which will then add up to make the vector dS. Looking at the diagram, it seems clear that the component dx2 must be positive, but must be less than 1. The reason I say that is because the black E2 is in the right direction to make the component for a green ds, but it's too big. On the other hand, it looks like the component dx1, which will multiply the black E1, will have to be negative, and with a size somewhere between 2 and 3, so that it gives the right component vector in the inwards radial direction. Here is the vector diagram to illustrate the addition of those component vectors, which are shown in orange. This time you'll notice that I've labelled the orange arrows as vectors, the product of dx and e. That's because if I only put in the sizes of things like this, it doesn't really make sense. The values of dx1 and dx2 mapped as distances are really something like these orange lines. dx1 is correct and dx2 is much smaller because it's the multiplication of them with basis vectors that makes up the component vectors which then add up to ds. Anyway, if you recall, we've always considered e1 and e2 to have no units, no dimensions of length or whatever. So that you might at first think that dx1 and dx2 must both have the units of distance in order for this diagram to illustrate the addition which produces the displacement vector ds. Certainly dx1, which in a way is dr, has units of distance, but dx2 is the change in the angle d theta, and angles don't have units. Something else must be going on, and it's all to do with the fact that e2 increases linearly with r. We're going to get a distance measure within the basis vector e2, but, but let's see how it works out. We can write down the formula again for the squared magnitude of any small vector ds in terms of its contravariant components and the metric tensor. ds squared equals dxm, dxn, gmn. And again, for two dimensions, we can expand this Einstein summation equation to become this. We've seen this before, it's all very nice, but there's our apparent problem. Distance squared, distance squared, R squared, distance times angle, two of them, and angle squared. How can this all make sense? We need to ask what the G values are. What is the metric tensor for this polar coordinate system? Well, we know that the G values are given by the dot product of the various basis vectors. The first one here relates to the x1 direction, or the r direction, for which we said that the basis vector had unit size. This means that e1 dot e1 is 1. Furthermore, the two middle lines here must be 0, because throughout the space, e1, from the radius r, is always at right angles to e2. However, what is the bottom one here? The dot product of e2 with itself, the angle basis vector with itself. Well, we said earlier that E2, the basis vector from theta, is linearly dependent on the value of the radius r, and we gave E2 a magnitude of r, meaning E2 gets bigger at greater radii. In practice, this means that the magnitude of E2, the theta basis vector, has to be equal to r, the radius.
And the upshot of this, of course, is that the dot product of E2 with itself must be R squared in value. And so we have for the metric tensor of polar coordinates 1, 0, 0, R squared. Now the middle two terms being 0 here means that the ds squared, which we now know is given by this formula, must have no middle terms. And so the formula becomes this. And substituting what we now know for g11 and g22, this get, then gives ds squared equals dx1 squared plus r squared dx2 squared. Or, in the more familiar measures of r and theta, ds squared equals dr squared plus r squared d theta squared. This now makes sense in, one, in, in a way. Distance squared, distance squared, distance squared. We've got the distance measure for the x2 dimension, the angle dimension, from the metric tensor rather than from the component measure, which was an angle. And we can now state clearly for this polar coordinate situation that the metric tensor is given by 1, 0, 0, R squared. Now the first thing to notice, I think, is that this metric tensor is not constant throughout the flat space. Different places in space have different values of one of the four terms in the metric tensor when using polar coordinates. Of course, anywhere on a given concentric circle would have the same metric tensor components because all points on that circle would be at the same radiance r. We might even fancifully call them equimetric circles. But all places of different radius would have a different number in this position for this metric tensor. And finally, for our discussion on polar coordinates, we could ask what the inverse of this polar coordinate metric tensor is. What is the matrix that, when acting on the metric tensor, would give the identity matrix? Well, let me simply state it here. It's this. Notice the upper indices for the inverse of the metric tensor. And also notice the 1 over r squared in this bottom position. Here, for comparison, is the metric tensor itself, with lower indices. Notice that the inverse is very similar to the metric tensor itself, the difference being that in the G22 position it has 1 over R squared instead of R squared. Now you can check out whether these two, when multiplied together, give the identity matrix 1, 0, 0, 1. Anyway, that's it for those three ways of making measurements in a flat two-dimensional space. We've looked at three examples of different frames of reference or measurement systems and they gave different metric tensors for measuring the same flat two-dimensional space. The straightforward Cartesian coordinates gave an extremely simple looking metric tensor of 1, 0, 0, 1. Then we found that the frame with the obliquely angled x2 axis gave the metric tensor as 1 cos alpha cos alpha 1 where alpha the angle between the coordinate lines was the same everywhere in the space. Thirdly, polar coordinates on the same flat space gave the metric tensor to be 1, 0, 0, R squared. Before we move on to the next video and turn our attention to curved two-dimensional spaces measured using curvilinear coordinates, it might be instructed to have a short digression on the distinction between curved space and curved coordinates. Sometimes when starting to learn general relativity, it can be confusing as to whether we're thinking about issues relating to curved space or to curved coordinates. And even in teaching it, it's easy to slip into saying the wrong thing, identifying the space, perhaps, when we really mean the coordinate system or frame of reference. We should realise by now, I think, that even a flat space can be measured and described by curvilinear coordinates, which are twisting and stretching. It doesn't have to be, of course. Cartesian coordinates can always be used to make measurement of a flat space. However, if the space itself is curved, or in simple terms distorted or stretched, then we have no option but to use curvilinear coordinates to make measurements within it. The distinction between simply stretched coordinates and stretched space can be confusing at first, so perhaps the following short digression may help to clarify things.
Consider this very simple one-dimensional example. Here is an axis x1, which is for the moment representing a one-dimensional flat space with no stretches or contractions in it. As it is flat, we can use a one-dimensional version of Cartesian coordinates to make measurements within it, and here are the unit markings. Furthermore, we could show the basis vectors for each section. In each case, they are all exactly equal to 1 in size and are all in the positive x1 direction. Suppose now that the space between two of these adjacent sections were to be stretched by some factor. In reality, this would likely be some kind of smooth or continuous stretch like this, where we visualize it going into a second dimension. But for simplicity, let's assume it has basis vectors over these two sections, which have size equal to exactly 2. This would mean that E1 would be equal to 2 throughout the whole of that curved or stretched region. This would necessitate there being discontinuities, sudden changing from 1 to 2, and then suddenly back from 2 to 1. But this is a very simplified illustration. You can see that I've stretched the frame of reference in that region such that we have a basis vector of size equal to 2. And that stretching of the coordinate system was necessary in order to accommodate the stretching of the space. It should be clear that because the space itself is stretched, we have been forced to use stretched coordinates in that particular region. Now, in a sense, this one dimension is still a straight line. There's no obvious curving as far as the so-called beings who might inhabit that space are concerned. There's no dimension to curve into. However, somehow, part of the region has been stretched, and showing it like this, bulging into an extra dimension, is the only way that we, as outsiders, are enabled to appreciate, or in a way, to see the stretching of the space. This is now being measured with what we would call curvilinear coordinates. But as I say, the occupants of the space would clearly have no experience of a second dimension. They would not directly be aware of any bump upwards. Their experience would be more like this, where I've put the basis vector labels on top of the stretched region. They still experience what seems to them, at least superficially, to be a flat space, which in one dimension, we show here again as a line. But clearly there's something strange about it. Although to the inhabitants it may seem superficially flat, the basis vector of the measuring system that has to be used in that middle region is larger than normal. It's twice as large. And so measurements made in that region would somehow be different to those made in other places. Recall, for example, that the arc length of an infinitesimally small vector ds at a point in space is given generally by this formula shown in the Einstein summation convention. In two dimensions, you should recall, this would mean that ds squared could have four components. However, we're only looking at a one-dimensional space here, and so any length ds measured in this space would simply have a squared value of this ds squared would be the measured dx1 squared times g11. Of course, the g11 in most of the one-dimensional space here that we're considering is 1, and so the measured value dx1 would be the same as the actual value of ds in those regions. However, in the stretched region, g11 will be equal to 4, because g11 equals e1 dot e1, so it's 2 squared, which is 4. And this means that although in most parts of the space we would have the measured value of dx1 equal to ds, in the stretched region we would have the measured dx1 equal to half of ds. The measured value of any dx1 in that central region would shrink by a factor of 2. Remember, ds itself doesn't change. You know by now, of course, that this is because the displacement vector ds is a contravariant vector, so that as the basis vector e1 increases, the measured value dx1 must decrease in proportion. The basis vector e1 has doubled, so the measured value must have halved.
Now, suppose we had such an infinitesimally small but constant displacement vector, and we moved it through the space from left to right. Here is how the measurement of that vector would change according to those in the space. The vector is at the dot, and the arrow is simply to illustrate its measured value. And you should be able to see that as soon as the dot passes the point where the stretching starts, the measured size is halved. And then when it returns to the E1 equals 1 region, the measurement returns to its correct value. And you probably realise that all this can also be understood from the usual one-dimensional formula for a contravariant vector, which we could rather unconventionally label Vcon. Vcon is V1, E1. The vector Vcon must stay the same, so if this basis E1 increases in a region of the space, then this, the measured component of it, the only component in this case, must go down in proportion at least for this contravariant vector. But what if we had a covariant vector, Vcov, such as some sort of field vector, something which had been computed in such a way that X1 was on the bottom of its formula? How would this be affected if it were taken across that region? Field vectors, as we understand them, are covariants, and they don't go down as E1 increases. In fact, they go up in the same proportion. How do we explain that using this argument? Well, in an earlier video number four, we showed that the contravariant or upper components of a vector are related to its covariant or lower components via the metric tensor like this, Vn lower equals Vm upper times Gmn. In our situation here, however, we only have one dimension. And so we can say that V1 lower is equal to V1 upper times the metric tensor G11. And G11, of course, is the dot product of E1 with itself. Now we can rearrange this equation to give us the contravariant component V upper in terms of the covariant component V lower and E1. And we can do it like this. V1 upper equals V1 lower divided by E1 dot E1. Now, if we take our covariant vector Vcov and write our usual expression for that vector in terms of its contravariant component, we have Vcov equals V1 upper times E1. And if we then substitute this expression for the contravariant component, we get this. Vcov vector equals V1 lower times E1 over E1 dot E1. We now have this covariant vector written in terms of its covariant component measure, V1 lower, and a mixture of the E1 lowers. If you think about this version of the formula for Vcov, you can see that if the E1 lower basis vector is stretched from a magnitude of 1 to 2, then this applies to all three things here, and so this whole thing will go down by a factor of two. However, as the vector v itself cannot have changed, then this means that the measured covariant component v1 lower of the vector must also increase by a factor of two. It is indeed seen to be a covariant vector. Its measured value, the covariant component, does the same thing that the basic vector does. Here is our illustration of how the measurement of this sort of field vector, a covariant vector, would change as it moved through our simple one-dimensional, partly stretched space from left to right. Remember, the field value under consideration is at the dot, and as soon as it passes where the stretching starts, the measurement of it increases in size. It is doubled, until, of course, it passes out of the stretch region, whereupon it returns to its normal value. Now, I hope that little digression has helped, maybe, to clarify in the minds of some people the difference between the space stretching and the coordinate stretching, in other words, between curved space and the use of curvilinear coordinates. This one simple example of a one-dimensional curved space could only illustrate stretching. 
it could not be drawn to illustrate any kind of contraction of the basis vector, and it also could not discuss any changing in the direction of the coordinates, which is only possible with spaces of two or more dimensions. And we'll discuss all of that later. In most of the earlier discussions in this video, the metric tensors under consideration have been for frames of reference being used to make measurements on a straightforward, flat, two-dimensional surface, a plane. However, in the next video, we'll turn our attention to a curved two-dimensional space. The discussion will be similar to the one so far in that we will use this formula for the square of the size of an infinitesimally small displacement ds in terms of its contravarying components, and we'll use it to investigate the metric tensor of frames of reference which necessarily have curvilinear coordinates. I say necessarily because they will be used to make measurements on a curved two-dimensional surface, and in order to do that, curvilinear coordinates will have to be used. From a discussion of differential arc length, this video number 5 discussed the metric tensors for various different frames of reference. In the next video number 6, we will move to thinking about the metric tensor for coordinates used to measure curved spaces, and we will also discuss more about transformations from one frame of reference to another. Mm -hmm.